passages of Scripture here. And I, uh, I preached at a, an impact conference in Mississippi on Friday. And I usually preach a sermon at home before I venture out to preach it out. But that one didn't work out like that this time. So I preached this on Friday. And uh, I thought, well, I want to preach that at home. And so I just kind of got it reversed a little bit. But I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to preach it to you today. And I think God wants to help us. I feel, I feel just a, a rise in the tide yeah, of the Holy Ghost. Yeah. I, say it like that. I just feel like, you know, when, when the tide rises, all, all the boats go up. And I just feel like everything is being touched and everything is kind of going up. We, we miss Brother Arnold. He's evangelizing again. He's evangelist, bishop, pastor, teacher. He's trying to he's trying to get all fivefold ministries on his business card. And, uh, and he's in California today, so we want to pray for him. Verse number one, Acts chapter eight. At that time, there was great persecution against the church. They were all scattered abroad throughout Judea and Samaria except the apostles skip down to verse 5 then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them and the people with one accord gave heed to the things which Philip spake hearing and seeing the miracles which he did for unclean spirits crying with a loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lame were healed and there was great joy in that city but in the but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some <clears throat> great one. You got to watch out for people that's always promoting themselves. Like, like they say, great one. You know? <laughs> to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying, this man is the great power of God. Or if I can say it like this, he kind of had the corner on the religious market in Samaria. Right. Verse 11, And to him they had regard. They, they paid him respect and reverence because for a long time he had bewitched them with sorceries. But when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. Verse 14, when the apostles heard that were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of the Lord, when they heard that, they knew, well, wait a minute, that's where they've been bewitched there for a long time. We better send reinforcements. And so they sent... Peter, John, they come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For the Holy Ghost was not yet fallen on none of them. They were only baptized in the name of the Lord. Then laid they their hands on them, and they received the Holy Ghost. Right. Amen. If you're here today and you've never received the Holy Ghost, you can receive the Holy Ghost. Amen. If you've never been baptized in Jesus' name, you can be baptized in Jesus' name. And I want to preach for a few minutes on this thought. The sin, stronghold, and salvation of Samaria. I know it's not a fancy title, but that's, that's what we're going to talk about. The sin, the stronghold, and the salvation of Samaria. Turn around and look somebody in the eye and say, we're glad you're here. Now look back at him and say, you're supposed to always be here. God bless you. You may be seated. If you are here this morning and you have been born again of the water and of the Spirit, which means you have repented of your sins, you've been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, then you represent the hope for this city and even the hope for your lost family. And we're not special because we're saved. We're just common, ordinary, average people who have been forgiven, redeemed. And we have experienced the grace and mercy 
of a just God. If we were to pass the microphone around, we would all admit that we have had an undeniable encounter and experience with the cross, with the blood, and with the power of the Holy Ghost. Amen. And as great as all of that is, because we have been saved, we have also been given an opportunity, a mandate, a commission to advance the kingdom of God in this world city. Yes, sir. What a humbling and sobering revelation that should be. It is. That God would use me and that God would use you to help expand His cause in His church. The Apostle Paul said it like this in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. He says, we are ambassadors of Christ. Which means God is, he said, making his appeal through us. God is using us to make an appeal to lost people to come into the family of God. What a great calling. And I'm not here today to just pat us on the back and tell us that we've done well and, and we could do that. And this, this church has done better than well. Under the leadership of Brother and Sister Arnold, this church has done better than well. Amen? And that's why you need to put on your calendar Saturday, August the 12th. We're going to celebrate Brother and Sister Arnold. I know she's here. She's shaking her head no, so she's going to get on to the But we're going to have a a promotion and celebration service for our bishop and his wife at 2 o'clock on Saturday, August the 12th because this church has done better than well. And we're thankful for that. But with that being said, it is not God's will for us to just fold our arms and twiddle our thumbs and set back and put our legs up and wait on the coming of the Lord. Absolutely not. The purpose of today's sermon is to remind us, inspire us, and hopefully equip us with what we need to reach this community and reach this city before the rapture of the church. And we are racing the rapture of the church. And so let me just encourage you today that might be a little weary in the journey and remind you that you are not by yourself Amen. and you are not all alone and you are not insignificant. The book says you are an ambassador. You are representing Jesus Christ. We have access to the throne room of God Almighty. You are called. We are chosen. We are anointed. We have the same Spirit dwelling in us that they had dwelling in the first church in the book of Acts. And because of that, Jesus said, greater works than these shall ye do. I'm thankful for the revival we're having around the world, but I believe God wants to give that same measure. God wants to give that same intensity of revival to the local church. What I'm trying to say is we don't have to take a back seat to anybody. We don't have to play second fiddle to anybody. We are not ill-equipped and we are not illegitimate. We are the church, the blood called Holy Ghost people, Jesus' name, church, and according to this book, the gates of hell.
You know, when you're... Not that any of you would watch TV, I get that, but when others watch TV, when you're watching TV, you know, they'll, they'll have a few minutes of action and then they'll, they'll drop a few commercials in to pay for what you just watched. So let me just hit pause for a minute and give you a commercial real quick because I just thought of this. But this past week, Brother and Sister Ray Holly celebrated 53 years, I think. So the last five minutes has been brought to you by the Holly family and their 53rd wedding anniversary. So we thank you. A few weeks ago, the Lord began to deal with me just about, not, not really a subject per se, but just about the city of Samaria. Everybody say Samaria. Samaria. And as I began to study a little bit about that city and about that region and about the historical uh, background of it, I, I began to believe that I could easily interchange the name of the city of Samaria with the name of our city. Amen. So everybody say Gainesville. Gainesville. It appears to me that God has always had a special pull and longing for the city of Samaria. According to the book of John, it says this about Jesus and about that city in John 4 and 4. The Bible says that He must needs go through Samaria. The words must needs in the Greek means that it is right. It is proper. It is necessary. It is required. He had to get to Samaria. Just like He has to get to our city. It's the right and proper thing for Him to do. It is necessary. It is required. God had a desire, and you're going to see this unfold today, to do something supernatural in Samaria. And God has the same desire to do something supernatural in Gainesville. As a matter of fact, Samaria is one of only three regions that's called by name. In Acts chapter 1 and verse 8, it says, You shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem. And I'm in a church full of Bible quizzers, and I get told every time when I misquote a verse. So i got to get on my P's and Q's here. So I'm not going to quote, I'm going to read. Uh, in Jerusalem and in all Judea, and in Samaria. It's mentioned by name. Now remember, Samaria represents our city. So you shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and in Judea, and in Gainesville. See, sometimes when we read the Bible, we just read it as a history book without reading it that it's really talking to us and our neighborhood too. When God wanted to draw a parallel between the right and the wrong way to minister, He used what sounds like the beginning of a good joke. A priest and a Levite and a Samaritan walks into a... But we know that that's the story of the good Samaritan. Again, God's letting us know that He has a pull for that area. According to Luke chapter 17, verse 11, it came to pass as He went to Jerusalem that He passed through the midst of Samaria. And it was here in this region that He healed the ten lepers. Because He wanted something miraculous to happen in that city. And only one came back to offer thanks. And Luke 17 and 16 says, And he fell down on his face at his feet, giving him thanks. And he was a Samaritan. And God made this Samaritan whole because he wanted those people to know, I have a desire to do something supernatural in your city. And God has touched and God has healed some of you, not just so you would be healed, but so that people in this city would know that there is a God that is able to do something supernatural. And the enemy is working overtime right now to try to convince some of us that our city is dried up, burnt over, 
This is one I've heard. Too liberal. Oh, right. Yeah. Devil is a liar. To, too concerned with other things to experience a genuine Holy Ghost revival. But by the end of this service, we're going to rebuke that thought. We're going to rebuke that spirit. Because we picked up in our text in the city of Samaria with the story that highlights and honors one of the great revivals that took place in the book of Acts. Even though for multiple generations it looked like the enemy was in control in that city. Even though for decades upon decades the city of Samaria struggled with sin and strongholds. Yet, God still had a definite desire to reach that city of Samaria. The Bible says in Acts 9 and 31 that He had, that had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria, and they were edified, walking in the fear of the Lord. Listen to this next phrase. And in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Hallelujah. Yeah. And multiply. Yeah. And this morning when I was going over this looking at it, this is what hit me and I wrote this down. They were walking in the comfort of the Holy Ghost. Right. Yeah. If you're not comfortable with the Holy Ghost. God cannot help us increase. If you're ashamed of the Holy Ghost, nobody's going to want what you're ashamed of. It's Pentecost Sunday. I wonder if there are any Holy Ghost filled people that you're comfortable. You're walking in comfort with the Holy Ghost. You're not ashamed that you're a comfort. Ashamed that you got the Spirit of God living on the inside of you. You're not ashamed that you traded your sin for His salvation. When the church starts walking in comfort of the Holy Ghost, then God can edify it. We walk in the fear of the Lord, then God can increase it. So let's talk about the sin of Samaria. Samaria means watch mountain. The origin of the city dates back to the days of the patriarchs, even though at that particular time it wasn't called Samaria yet, but the region was the same. Jacob, before he died, gave Joseph a blessing in which he called him a fruitful bow by a well. That blessing was fulfilled when Joseph's two sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, received as an inheritance the fertile land that eventually would become Samaria. It would not be called Samaria until the days of King Omri. He purchased this property because of its location and named it after a man that he purchased the land from. And King Omri, like many kings uh, in, the bib in biblical days and probably even today, was not a godly man. He did evil in the sight of the Lord. He rose to the throne of Israel through a series of assassination plots. Once he was in power, he didn't bring glory to God by the way he ruled the kingdom. As a matter of fact, he continued the pagan practices that were started with Jeroboam. And it just continued. And yet God still had a desire for that place. Such a longing to make Samaria a special place for His glory. So the sin of Samaria is that they simply worshipped other gods. They were a polytheistic society. And King Omri made it easy for his son, you'll know his son, Ahab, he made it easy for Ahab to continue the downward spiral of compromise and carnality and confusion. I don't want to make it easy for my daughter to sin. I don't want to make it convenient for the next generation to believe less, expect less, and experience less. I want to do everything in my power to impart generation something supernatural something that is godly and something that is holy i beg you let's not back up on the truth now let's not let go of separation now let's not do away with holiness now what we do in moderation our children will do in excess i don't want the next generation to go down i
And their sins, their sin was that they were worshiping other gods. And just like Samaria, just like Samaria, we, we too worship other gods. Okay? Now, I'm not here to, to pinpoint. Uh, matter of fact, I just ask for, for there to be no amens for a few minutes. Because because sometimes when we hate me and somebody else's sin, we're real quiet on ours. So we'll just be real quiet for a few minutes. Because because there, every city, every city has uh, spirits that that are attached there. And, and I'm not here to condemn anyone. Okay, because Jesus said, I didn't come to condemn. I just come to save. And you're not going to save anybody by condemning them. But, but there are probably people in this church and outside these walls that are worshiping other gods. Now, it may not be an altar with a stone image in front of it, but, but there are other gods in Gainesville that are worshiped frequently. Uh, and again, we don't, need, we don't need amens right now. It just may be Hollywood. Hold that one back in. He's like, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. It, it may be the love of money. It, uh, it may be too much, and I'm, I'm going to put too much in parentheses there. It may be too much of love for sports. It may be a longing to advance my career at any cost. These are gods that people worship. Right. Amen. Right. It, it may be just the, the weekend getaways. You know, our churches would be a whole lot better if we had them on Monday and people were faithful to, 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 to Monday church like they are Monday work. And I'm not, you know this. I mean, you've heard me say that. I want you to go on vacation. I want you to go have fun. I get all that. But not every weekend. It's about soul. You know, and so, but you have these guys, perversion, yeah. sexual sins, yeah. no events, oh. homosexuality, oh. addiction to drugs, yeah. there, there's all alcohol, there's all sorts of images and gods and things that are worshipped. You see, sin will allow God to take on many shapes and sizes. And, and in Samaria, it eventually became a calf. So they were worshiping a cow. Now that's just funny to me. How anybody could worship a cow and think that God's into that. But just like we would laugh at them, if they were to show up today, they would probably laugh at the things we worship as well. That's true. That's true. They say, well, you left at us for, for worshiping around a cow, but you're worshiping a bunch of dead presidents on green paper. <laughs> Our city struggles with sin. And yet God's desire is that he must needs go to Samaria. He knows, listen, he knows there are people in this community that committed adultery last night. And he still wants to show up. He knows there are people here who are worshiping other things. Yet he still feels a, a requirement. A compelling. And I want to go there. Let, let me give somebody an encouraging word today. God is not intimidated by the sins of Gainesville. God is not concerned about how long the sins have been here. I'll even take a step further. He's not shocked by it either. As a matter of fact, that's what makes him want to show up. He didn't need a drink of water from Jacob's well in John chapter 4. He, that's not why he had to get to Samaria. He wanted to help a lady break the endless cycle of fornication, adultery, and divorce. And she had some issues he didn't just show that's why he showed up because she had some issues that she could not control herself and God said I must needs get there so I can help her break out of that situation he had a desire to get there that
that day, not because she was perfect. Thank you, thank you, Lord. He had a desire to show up that day because he wanted to turn a mistress into a missionary. All right. Come on. He had a desire to go there because of the sin that she was involved in. Not to make her feel comfortable with her sin, but to give her a choice. You can either leave your water pot that's been on your shoulder. You can drink from this well and leave that water pot and never carry that burden again. Or you can keep letting sin burden you down. It's your choice. And somebody is going to have a choice today that you can either lay down that sin and you can lay down that stronghold and you can walk out of here free or throwing this out there. we got to get more sinners in the church. It's, it's the church. Jesus said, I didn't come for, for righteous people or well people. He said, I come to seek and save those which are lost. We've got, we've got to get more sinners. All that stuff that I threw out Sunday night about what we can do and different things. You know what the purpose of all of that is? Try to get sinners into the church. The reason why we don't have more people getting the Holy Ghost is because we don't have more people in the church that needs the Holy Ghost. And then what happens is the church that was supposed to be a hospital for the lost and dying now becomes a museum where we can look and say, look what God has. city. The good, the bad, and the ugly. Let's just embrace it. Embrace every issue, every sin, every power that's working against us and help me proclaim with a loud voice that where sin abounds, the grace of God does much more of that. Because there's sin in your life, you can have the Holy Ghost. Because there's sin in your life, you can meet the grace of God. That's the sin of Samaria. And if we don't allow sins to be resolved, then that sin will eventually become a stronghold. A stronghold is just unrepented sins. You, you come to a service, you felt the need to repent, you didn't repent. That sin got just a little tighter grip on you. And then you fast forward 5, 10, 15 years down the road and you have the stronghold in your life that never had to become a stronghold. But for whatever, and we've all had them, so I'm not preaching at you, I'm preaching with you. We have all have strongholds, but if we just look back, go, man, if I'd have just never smoked that second cigarette. Amen. Actually, if I'd have just never smoked the first one, but some of you just got to learn on your own, so whatever. But, but that sin that became unrepentant now becomes stronghold. Right. And just like sin, see, this is what makes pornography so dangerous. Is because it just it's got to lead to something else. So you can't just stop with this. You know, you you don't want to be too graphic, but you're not gonna always just be satisfied with the JC Penny catalog. The swimsuit issue is not gonna continue. And then just Nudity is not going to do it. No. And then before you know it, you're into more perversion. It's just unrepentant <laughs> sin. So we talk about all the time, we need to cast down our stronghold. We make it sound like it's so, some, so super spiritual. All we're saying is you just got to start repenting. Amen. For sins. Every day. Every day. And take care of that. And pull that down. You don't 
don't pull it down at one service. Just like the stronghold didn't take hold in one day. Does that make sense? So we want to we wanna take it little by little. That's how you're going to possess the promised land and that's how people backslide. Little by little. And so a stronghold is nothing more than unresolved sin. And Samaria's sin was that they worshipped other gods. But because they didn't repent, then that sin introduced a stronghold named Jezebel. Jezebel lived in Samaria. Ahab's wife was Jezebel. And Jezebel is more than just a painted up woman in Scripture that, that, that the enemy used to seduce. Jezebel, and Jezebel is not just a female. Jezebel is a spirit. The spirit of Jezebel is a preacher controlling spirit. And a preacher controlling spirit is always going to turn into a preacher killing Yep. And when King Omri died and Ahab took over, the first order of business was to bring Jezebel to Samaria. And she built temples now to her false gods. So we went from building an altar, sin, to now building temples, stronghold. And that spirit and stronghold of Jezebel is in every one of our cities. Yep. As a matter of fact, that's why preachers go crazy. Yep. That's why preachers quit and backslide and run off and do goofy John. It's not the sin that makes them do that. It's the stronghold that makes them do that. It's that controlling spirit that kind of puts their, their hands around the neck of the preacher, try to choke the life out of them. Let me, let me prove to you what I mean. Elijah deals with the sin on Mount Carmel. He calls fire down from heaven. Mighty manifestation of the Spirit of God. He gets rid of all the prophets of Baal. He's able to withstand 450 men. He had the strength to handle all of that, but the Spirit of Jezebel says she was going to kill him. And one woman did what 450 men could. With a word. And put him on the run. As a matter of fact, got to the point to where he, co he contemplated committing suicide. He decided he would quit. He decided no one else was living for God. He decided it would be better either for me to end up in a grave or a cave. And that's where he ended up, in a cave. And the reason why some of you feel like quitting and you feel like throwing in the towel and you feel like you wrestle with stupid thoughts of failure and contemplating doing things you didn't think you would ever do and that you're too afraid to tell anyone about, it, it's not the sin that's making you feel like that. It's the stronghold that's making you feel those feelings. And that stronghold is trying to manipulate you and make you think that God cannot do the supernatural in your life. And if He can't do the supernatural in your life, then surely He can't do the supernatural in this city. But there's something special about Samaria and there's something special about Gainesville. And I want to prophesy that something's going to happen today and that stronghold is going to begin to be broken. We're going to begin to pull that stronghold down and we're going to replace that stronghold with something supernatural. You don't have to quit. You don't have to throw in the towel. You don't have to believe the lies of the enemy. But the reality is, he that had begun a good work in you shall perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Don't let the sin intimidate you. Don't let the stronghold make you run and hide in a cave. God is stronger than the strong man. He is greater. And greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Amen. So, you got the sin, an altar. You got the stronghold, a temple. And then that stronghold takes root. And you fast forward through 1 Kings and 2 Kings and through the prophets. And then you jump over all the way to Acts chapter number 8. And you see the same region, Samaria. Still battling sin. They got a stronghold there. 
It's not Jezebel anymore in the sense of name or gender. It's now Simon. He's a male. And he has bewitched the people. He has convinced them that he is some mighty man of God. Listen to me. Anytime a geographical location has a promise of God connected to it, then that location will always be fought by the enemy. Just look at Israel. Do you know why 20 years ago you went through all the horrible stuff that you went through with this building is because there's something supernatural and a promise connected to this place. And so the enemy does everything he can to try to manipulate, choke out, kill, control. That's why some of you are fighting devils the way you're fighting devils right now. It's just because the enemy is trying his best. He knows there's something special going to happen in Samaria. Amen. He knows there's supposed to be something special to happen in Gainesville. But they didn't want to go to Samaria for whatever reason. They were happy in Jerusalem. And the only way they went to Samaria was because of persecution. Persecution is never sent to make us retreat. It's sent to be the fuel that propels us to our destiny. Too many times we fight against things that God's using to propel us. And the enemy had a stronghold in Samaria. And the same is true with our city. But our God is great. Our God is strong. Samaria had been bewitched. But when the apostolic church showed up, the enemy's hold had to be loosened. There was a time when just twitching the nose indicated that allergy season was near. But a little over 50 years ago, a little show showed up on TV called Bewitched. And Bewitched was just a good little, you know, a good little show to highlight the favorable side of witchcraft. And Samantha Stevens, witch turned housewife, could have magical powers by just, you know, wiggling her nose. So, but if you fast forward now 51 years, witchcraft is, is probably more acceptable and accessible now than it's ever been. As a matter of fact, I'm, I'm probably about to, you, you're not going to believe what I'm going to say, so you're going to go home and try it. You're, you're going to prove me, but I'm, I'm right. The five largest faith groups in the United States is Christianity, Judaism, Islam, Hinduism, Wicca. That's pagan, Wicca. As a matter of fact, one article that I read said that Christianity is in a serious state of decline. Yeah. It stated that one of the fastest growing faiths in America is the faith of Wiccan. Yeah. Yeah. It's been estimated that the number of Americans that are Wiccans doubles every two and a half years. At this point, there are more than 200,000 registered witches in America. And, uh, and approximately 8 million unregistered. Now think about this. Every two and a half years, they go. I wonder how long it's been since we've doubled. Amen. I can't help but believe with information like that and with growth like that and with many people willing to follow something so shallow and shady that, that this nation must be experiencing an insatiable appetite for the supernatural. I believe that this world is tired of false religion, dead programs, lifeless pulpits. So they're flocking to anything that can show them a hint or resemblance of something that could be called supernatural. And before we condemn them, let's critique us. Because I'm afraid today the church in America has become more modern than miraculous. It's become more entertaining than empowering. More apologetic than apostolic. But I want to stand before you today and declare that the only solution for the sin and the stronghold of Samaria is an apostolic church. And the answer to the sin and the stronghold of Gainesville, Florida is an apostolic church.
apostolic church. I don't know about you, but I don't want a witch to out-worship me. And I don't want some kingdom of darkness to grow faster than this church can grow. So I'm on a mission that somehow, someway, God needs to help us double. God needs to help us reach out to the highways and byways and compel them to come in. I don't want somebody caught up with false religion to make more noise than I do and to make more of an impact than I do. The devil is alive. serve notice to every enemy in this city, in this county, in this region, that you have bewitched this place long enough. I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. We've been bewitched long enough. It's now time to be filled. We've been bewitched long enough. It's now time to be filled. Be filled with the Holy Ghost. So for a thousand years almost, Samaria struggled with sin and strongholds. But then three little preachers showed up. Philip, Peter, and John. And that thousand year old stronghold, it began to be broken. Because that is the salvation of Samaria. That's right. Amen. Now this week I flew to I flew to Mississippi and uh, we uh, with the UPC because I travel so much and rent enough cars I, I can now just pick any car I want. So you know you just you you pay one small fee for the smaller car and you upgrade for free. You know? So when I walked into the a uh, room that day to pick out my car. I had three choices. I had a, I had a Nissan Altima, and I had a Chevrolet Impala. And then sitting next to that, Brother Teddy, was a, a BMW Sports Utility. Oh yeah! I've never driven a BMW in my life. But it's. It's the same price. I'm going to a conference. And everybody there knows that I've recently moved to Gainesville. And the little honorary side of me said, if I drive that BMW, Somebody's going to say, well, <laughs> he went and got that big church and got a little car he's driving. And I just thought it would be good for someone to think that. <laughs> so, Grandma Gummer, I chose the BMW. I'm driving. And I get there, and I, I tell a friend of mine about this. I said, hey, Ride with me to church tonight, because I told him my little weird way of thinking. You know? And so when he was getting in, he said, is this it? I said, yeah. He said, you do know it has a Florida license plate on it, don't you? I said, I didn't know that. Even then. So here we are today. The price has been paid. We're all in the rental car uh -huh. parking lot. Mm -hmm. 
You can choose a Chevrolet Impala today. And you can shake a preacher's hand. And you can say you're saved if that's what you want to drive. You could quote a sinner's prayer, which there is no Bible for it, none whatsoever. And you could allow a man pronounce over you that if you said that prayer, you're now saved. And you could drive that Nissan all the time. But the price has already been paid. Or you can go ahead and say, God, I want the same spirit living on the inside of me that I just heard that preacher preach about, which is a spirit that took care of the sin and stronghold of Samaria. And when they laid their hands on them, they received the gift of the Holy Ghost. I want you to slip your hands up all over this place. I know, I know, under the sound of my voice, that I am preaching to some people and there is sin in your life. You, don't, you do not have to leave here without repenting of those sins. There are you with your hands raised and you know good and well, and I'm not condemning you. I'm just, it's just a fact. There are strongholds in your life. Sins that you haven't repented of in a long time. You do not have to leave without that stronghold starting to be pulled down. The sin, the stronghold, is worshiping other gods, not repenting of your sins, but the salvation of Samaria and the salvation of Gainesville is to repent of your sins. And just like Sister Riley quoted today, get baptized in Jesus' name and you will receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. I wonder if there's anybody in this room today that you do not have the Holy Ghost. If our altar workers are get ready to get in place and they're going to help pray with you. And we want to help you. And we want to, we want to lead you into this great experience that you have with God. But if you're here today and you don't have the Holy Ghost, I don't want you to leave without you receiving the Spirit of the Lord. And if you're here and there's strongholds in your life and you're ready to take authority over your situation. I want you to come to this front and I want you to believe that today's the day that God's going to help me break this sin and this stronghold. Come on with your hands raised and no one looking around and they begin to sing. Can you come to the front today and let's spend a few minutes talking to Jesus. God, I need you to help me resolve this sin. I need you to help me take care of this stronghold, God. In the name of Jesus, you don't have to leave the same way you came. 